I'm not a big fan of horror games, but there's been one doing the rounds recently that looked like a lot of fun. Buckshot Roulette is a twist on the infamous Russian Roulette, where you use a 12 gauge shotgun instead of a revolver to gamble your life on. You play against this chap here who gets increasingly more irate the more he gets shot in the face. It's basically a game of chance and educated guessing, but how does it work under the hood and can we do anything to improve our odds? So I purchased the game and it comes with a Linux and Windows version. Now, I quite like debugging on Linux, so let's give that a go. Mixes things up from the normal Windows game reverse engineering. However, despite liking Linux, I only ever really use it through WSL, i.e. through my Windows machine. With a little persuading and some extra command line arguments, we can get the Linux version to work under WSL, but to send the output to an X server running on Windows. It's not perfect, it complains about a lack of fog and seems to have a permanent colour shift in this blood splatter, but we got there in the end. I'm not sure if anyone has ever gone to this much effort just to run GDB, but here we are. Now our tools of choice are Ghidra for disassembly and decompilation, and GDB for debugging. I'm also using the Jeff plugin for GDB because it makes it marginally less terrible to use. After a quick bit of research, I can see that the game was made with the Godot engine. Now I've never used this before, so be prepared for me to make some absolutely wild assumptions about how it works under the hood. The entire game is packaged as a single executable, which means the engine, the scripts, the assets, etc. all live somewhere within this one file. I've had a quick look through the strings in the binary and nothing stands out to me as a script, specifically a GD script, which I've learned is the Godot language of choice. If I were to guess, I'd say that all the scripts are probably pre-compiled into some sort of bytecode and embedded in the binary, because it doesn't make sense for every time you run the game to recompile all the scripts. This is going to make it quite difficult to track down the game logic as we have no idea what form it's in, whether it's compressed or obfuscated or even where anything is. Sometimes you have to put yourself in the developer's shoes. If I were making this game, I would want to use some sort of random number generator to decide how many live and blank shells there were going to be and in what order. Google has informed me that if I want random numbers in Godot, I want to use the random number generator class and these associated methods. So my hunch is that one or several of these are being called when the round is set up. Now the game binary has been stripped, so all the class names have been removed, but it does contain the string random number generator, and if you follow it through to the code that loads it, you end up with this hot mess. Just staring at it at a high level, I can see it's doing something with all the methods for this class, And if we set a breakpoint on it, we can see it gets hit right as the program starts, so it's definitely doing some sort of initialization. Luckily for us, Godot is open source, so let's clone it and have a poke around. Okay, there's a class called random number generator, and it has a function called bind methods. This looks very much like our mystery function, and now it makes a bit more sense what is going on. When your GD script is run, it will need to call out to the native C++ implementation of its library functions. What this function is doing is binding the actual address of the function to its name, so that when a script calls, for example, randy range, the engine knows to call this function. This also makes sense why it's called at the beginning of the program. So I've painstakingly pulled all these functions out of the disassembly and set breakpoints on them, but they're never hit. I also went deeper into the internals of the random number generator and matched up this function to this disassembly by searching for these massive constants, but it's still not hit. I was feeling a bit out of ideas at this point. I've got no scripts, no code to break on, and no idea how it was doing its randomness. Perusing semi-randomly through the Godot documentation, I've stumbled across this interesting feature. The built-in array type has a shuffle method which could conceivably be used to randomise a collection of shotgun shells. Now we get to do the dance of trying to match this code to its disassembly in Ghidra. A lot of these array methods do a check that the array is not in a read-only state, and this string gets embedded in the function call. So if we look up all the references to this string, we can see it's loaded loads of times, but the function doing the loading also includes the name of the function it's being called from. So I've just gone through all of these until I found the one for shuffle. So now we set a breakpoint on this, And look at that, it's called, just after we're shown, how many shells there are. Interestingly, it's called twice, but the first argument, a pointer to the array being shuffled, is the same in both calls. Not sure why we need the double shuffle, but I'm not a Godot expert. In fact, for any Godot developers out there, please comment on any mistakes I've made. 
Let's dig a little deeper and verify that this is indeed shuffling what we think it is. As we said, the first argument is the implicit this variable, which is just a pointer to the object itself. Now, if we dump some data on the other end of this pointer, we'll get the member variables for this array class. Looking at the code, this will be a pointer to an array private object. So let's dump some bytes from that. Now, array private consists of a ref count, which we can see here, and a vector. Looks like this is a custom implementation of a vector, not the one in the C++ standard. So we'll need to figure out how this stores its data. A vector stores a cow data, which I'm going to assume means copy on write rather than being bovine related data. And finally, at the end of all this, we can see cow data stores a pointer called underscore pointer. So let's bring this all back together. What we can do now is that when shuffle is called, we can dump the data in the array. The problem now is that I have no idea what any of this data is. I mean, it could be anything wrapped in any number of Godot engine primitives. The interesting thing is these addresses. If we dump the array before and after the call to shuffle, we can see that they move around. So my guess is that these addresses are references to some internal game object for live and blank shells. Of course, the question now is which is which, and there's really only one way to find out. This is the live one. Now we know which object is which, but after playing a few more rounds, I've noticed something interesting. The array always starts off in the same order as shown here. So if we can disable the shuffle, then we'll always know the order of the shells. So what I've done is patch the shuffle function to always return as soon as it's called, effectively leaving the array as is. Now look at that. I can now play the game knowing the exact order of the shells. Of course, it's a little contrived to patch the binary. We could have just as easily patched it to jump straight to the end screen and call it a day, but it was fun trying to figure out some of the Godot internals. To take this further, we could patch the shuffle function to always leave the array in a state that is most advantageous to us as a player. But if you want to see some more low-level shenanigans, then check out this next video.